Hello, welcome to The Critical Witness. We're back. We haven't been around for a good couple of months. So uh, if you're with us tonight, well, thanks for watching. Uh, if you're catching up later on the podcast or on YouTube, do leave a comment, uh, subscribe, all that stuff. We are going to be having more conversations in the future. Um, so I mean that we're, we're back. So looking forward to having some good conversations with people. Um, I've got with me Dan and Mike Pierce, and we're going to be talking about um, history mainly, though there's obviously big things happening in Ukraine and Russia. That's the sort of area we're talking about uh, tonight. But Dan and I know very little about Ukraine and Russia. We're hoping Mike can help us out tonight. Um, Mike, we, am I, I am pronouncing your name correctly, aren't I? Yes, yes it's just <laughs> strangely spelled, yes. No worries. I just had a panic attack that I've just introduced <laughs> you <laughs> completely incorrectly. Um, welcome. And uh, would you just be able to share a little bit about yourself? Why why history and uh, why this region of the world particularly that you're, you've been interested in and, and a bit about your background? Okay. Um, well, I, I really cannot remember a time when I was not fascinated by history. So, uh, you know, even... My, myself at age five or six, uh, history was what I was about. And as a little kid in primary school, I spent all my pocket money on all those little ladybird history books and what have you, which had an, inc an incredible effect. I mean, even when I, once I'd become like, you know, a professional historian, I realized that on some topics um, that I didn't know very much about, and there's and historians only know about so many topics, obviously, when, when students used to ask me questions and I couldn't answer it. I mean, you're a historian, you're supposed to know this. And I say, history is everything that ever happened. You expect me to know that? And they would look back at you like an expression that meant, yeah. Uh, so, um, but, but when considering topics about which I know very little, I realized that my, um, the picture book in my brain that we all carry around with us, you know, um, is still dominated by those illustrations in Ladybird history books. So it goes mm -hmm. right the way back. Um, and although my ambitions changed, as, as happens with all, almost all of us while we're growing up, it kept coming back to history. So that was always the way it was going to be, I think. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I did my first degree in Quanti in Wales, uh, from where I get the eccentric spelling of Mike, um, and, and the names of my children, who are Yai and Bethan and Rian. Um, I hmm. guess played. the spelling in comments, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's right. So um, then stayed there until I guess my late 20s, something like that, or about th age 30, then went and um, did research in Oxford uh, in church history um, and then taught in what was then called London Bible College and later in my tenure was uh, London School of Theology, which it still is, and led the degree program there for... Uh, about 10 years, then moved over to the States, and I was professor of history in Houghton College in uh, the frozen tundra of western New York State uh, until fairly recently. Um, and during the course of all that, I, I got very, very heavily involved with the Balkans from the time of the, the wars in the 1990s onwards to the point where that became at least as much my specialization as church history. Um, yeah. And in about two weeks from now, I'm going to be moving to Croatia permanently to retire. So, oh wow, what, whereabouts are you aiming for? Uh, uh, out of curiosity, I have a, a house in Osijek, and that's where many of my friends are. So I'll be basing myself there, and um, uh, spending my my declining years um, um, uh, shouting insults at the world at large through writing and and, and, on, and, and abusing former students online, they, 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 they know what they're getting. That's basically it. <laughs> Sounds you, like a dream. You, you've yeah, also yeah. written a, a few books as well, Mike, haven't you? Because I actually read one of your books when I first uh, became aware of you is when you, you read the, you wrote the, the Gods of War. Ah, yes. Okay. Because, um, yes. Oh, I'm glad somebody's read that. Um, it was a great book. It's something oh, that I've recommended to people. I thought it was a, an excellent dealing with the topic. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, it was a sort of sequel to Why the Rest Hates the West, which is which outsold 
all my other books put together, which is not saying an awful lot. <laughs> um, but, but I think I shall always be the man who wrote Why the Rest Hates the West. Um, so, hmm. uh, by the same publisher, um, and just a couple of years earlier, for anybody who wants to look that up. Um, and I, I think all these years later, I still feel pretty good about that because the, the project predictions about the general trends as to where we were going are, I, I mean, if I brought out a second edition, I would, I would tweak it. I would not fundamentally change an awful lot, you know, so, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's nothing more of remote. <laughs> I'd uh, uh, be interested on the church history side because there, there's some aspects of that that might come into the conversation. So yeah. when, when you talk about church history, was there was that's, that's obviously quite broad. Was that more Western church history or does that incorporate the sort of Eastern? Well, the, 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 the downfall of most Western theological colleges is that they tend to treat just Western church history. And mm. I tried to, to, to broaden that. Um, I have, perhaps I should, this might alienate some people right away. My my theological colour, if you want to know, is broadly <laughs> Anabaptist, though I'm not a pacifist. Um, but that has made me reconsider some of the differences between, for example, the Orthodox churches and the Western churches. And uh, I have come to realise that on in, in theology, very narrowly defined, that is doctrines around God, and for that matter, around humanity, the Orthodox churches are closer to the early church than what happened with Catholicism, therefore also with Protestantism, Protestantism being, here I, here I lay there and lay a bunch more people, Protestantism being basically just a, a Catholic heresy. Heresy used in joking sense, of course. Um, uh, so so uh, that's that's kind of ironic, you know, in, because most Westerners tend to assume that, you know, Orthodox are simply Catholics with beards. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's just the women. Um, uh, but in fact, there are significant um, theological differences in in approach um, for all of the superficial similarities, and and so that's given me at least something of an appreciation for that. Um, what will be pertinent to the, the topic we're talking about this evening is, and it's one of the, the fatal flaws in Orthodox churches, is that they are very, very closely tied to the states in which they subsist and will justify them through thick and thin, and we're seeing that right now. Uh, and this goes right the way back into the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, in the West, the church was more powerful than the rather mostly rather flimsy barbarian states and that remained the case until the reformation which gave western rulers some kind of a choice um in their religious allegiance whereas in the east the state was almost more powerful than the church and the church was simply an arm of it and effectively its chaplain and that remained the case um surprisingly actually even during the communist era um and and is very noticeable today with the the behavior of the Russian Orthodox Church, which, however shocking it is to everybody uh, in its willingness to justify this criminal war, mm. um, uh, should not be surprising to those that, that know about how Orthodox churches typically function. Right. Do they have any justification for that? Is, is that just a, a sort of incident of, of history? Uh, or is there something sort of... Um, you know, intrinsic to orthodox theology that kind of lends itself to being in that kind of symbiotic sort of relationship with with the state. Well, just just in case we've got anybody still listening to this, let me alienate the last three and, <laughs> and, point, and point out or one. That although, <laughs> although Christians of all kinds think that doctrine comes first and our behaviour should follow it, you know, we should mm -hmm. follow where our doctrine leads. All studies of church history show that the actual direction of traction is the opposite first comes practice and coming trotting along after it comes a doctrine to justify it some years mm -hmm. later um, whether predicated on some kind of actual or supposed spiritual principle or some particular reading of scripture or or what have you 
Uh, and so it's simply kind of like post facto rationalization. Of course, you can find that, you know, submit yourselves to the authorities, you know, Romans 13, all of this. Mm. And then that it becomes a question of where, where do you want to take that? Um, and, and of course, and here's my Anabaptist self um, squeaking here. Um, that kind of doctrine looks very different if the church is itself allied to the state or has or, or encompasses populations at large rather than simply being in the sociological sense a sectarian movement apart from society as a whole which the early church was which the you know baptistic churches of all kinds today understand themselves in my view quite rightly as being so if you are actually allied to the state and and you know have a some kind of political agenda then you know that the whole idea about submitting yourselves to the public authorities looks very different right see i i've, I've always thought that um i guess like uh, like anabaptists etc is that if if a if a christian group or denomination how we want to term them uh, how how it's it's kind of how it arises um, affects its their their kind of uh, their relationship with the state. So yeah. if, if if they tend to be come out of persecution, you know, yeah. persecuted by the state, and that's the kind of origins of that movement, they, they tend to not to be very closely aligned with the state. And whereas I, I, I guess what will be interesting is obviously with the, the the church in Russia is actually they have gone through you know at least within the last hundred years quite um, uh, you know work. Persecute. I mean, if you look oh, at like Stalin's yeah. five-year plan for atheism and you know fifty thousand priests being but, murdered, etc. But, but, but um, hmm. when, when the the church was instantly, well, not instantly, but within a few months, rehabilitated following the Nazi invasion of June nineteen forty-one, it was rehabilitated in the the autumn of that year. Um, it was done so on the um, the basis that the church would preach up holy war against the wicked western invaders and right. the of holy mother russia um and throughout the cold war the church was suffered to exist but heavily politicized and to act as an arm of russian foreign policy with peace movements you know um uh working with organizations like cnd and what have you in in the west so is it just never rid itself of those of, of that influence? Not really. No. I mean, there have been brave individuals who have broken away, who are entirely ad well broken away. Um, not necessarily broken away from church, but have challenged that kind of line. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, uh, but that's they're doing so in spite of the overall meaning of their their church and its tradition. Yes. So, so what what's different in this case is so is um, the the I guess if we get into a little bit more, I guess now of Ukraine and, and, and Russia, is is what is obviously we're seeing two two very different perspectives from the church in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And and could you tell us a little bit about the the church in Ukraine and how it differs from um, uh, the, yeah. the church in Russia? Okay, I'm going to go cloudy on you here because it's so complicated that I can't. I've, I've never quite managed to hold it all in my head. I told you I'm not an expert on this, just in general mm -hmm. terms. That there are several Orthodox churches in Ukraine. Um, there is a Ukrainian Orthodox Church. There's a Russian Orthodox Church that's in communion with Moscow and one that isn't, I think. Um, in addition, uh, in the west of the country, which is the heart of Ukrainian nationalism, and we'll come on to this later, Western Ukraine and on the one hand and Central and East on the other have different histories. Wow. Um, uh, in Western Ukraine, there's the uh, Greek Catholic Church, um, or so, often known as uniates. Now, there are a number of these kinds of churches around the world, and the Ukrainian is the biggest, the, the one in Transylvania and Romania is the second biggest, and they are almost always um, emerging in situations where in the past, Orthodox populations lived under Catholic rulers, and right. many of the people there wanted to square themselves with the rulers. Now, Western Ukraine, for many centuries was under both Poland and then later on under Austria, both Catholic uh, kingdoms, uh, empire in the case of Austria. Um, and so a number of Orthodox people basically united with Rome as long as nothing changed. So priests still married with beards 
with the same liturgy as before, though now including prayer for the Pope. And on the theological issues, and most ordinary people don't understand theology, so that was an advantage in this case, they sided with Rome, not with the East. And so you have this uh, very influential Greek Catholic church in, in Ukraine, which even though it's only a, quite a small percentage of the Ukrainian population, is outsized in terms of its influence because it appears to articulate something that is distinctively Ukrainian. And, and, then, and then you have um, also a lot of uh, evangelical churches. Um, one other point I would want to make um, is that evangelicals in Central and Eastern Europe have done best in areas where the Catholic West bumps up against the Orthodox East, particularly, well, really where there are Uniate churches, not because Uniates are any closer to evangelicals than the Catholic or Orthodox churches are, but because you then have a large pool of people with no clear-cut ethno-religious identity. So if Let's get down to brass tacks here. You are a Baptist or a Pentecostal missionary going into um, uh, Dalmatia, say, where, where the population are, as the Germans would say, glutschwarz katholisch, you know, 100% Catholic, wall to wall. Who's going to be the first person to step out of line and join you? Hmm. Of course. You go to similar areas where everybody is Orthodox, same. But you go to Western Ukraine or you go to Transylvania, and other very ethnically and religiously mixed areas where there are Catholics, Orthodox, Greek Catholics, um, usually plenty of Jews historically, and also plenty of Germans, some of whom will be Lutheran or Reformed. Well, what's one more going to hurt? And in any case, there will be loads of people who have a, a father who's this and a mother who's that and, and, and so on. And, and so it doesn't never seem like a big deal. That's where those churches have prospered. That's really interesting. <laughs> so I, I, I was guess, just thinking that about mission, mission in general. Is that is that can that play out across the board? I, I've not really thought of that too too hard. Um, well, I guess yeah, it's, it, it sets a no, precedent. No, but certainly, in the case of Central and Eastern Europe, that's how it has played out and continues to play out. And that's true, not just at the level of macro explanation or meta explanation you just go into the churches and you look at who's there and ask who they are you know i've actually said what i just said to you in churches in central eastern europe particularly in the balkans and there have been smiles all around the room because i was describing precisely the people who were sitting there exactly what it is um i guess so we're skip, skipping around a little bit on which is which is great because it's interesting i guess maybe if we start um maybe from a, a sort of uh, yeah if you give us a sort of big picture of stuff like you know you, you, you the things you've been talking about sort of history of, of ukraine and russia and how we kind of got where we are um because yeah. uh, i think it would be it would be fascinating um okay well um as I was saying to you before we started the interview formally, just in the, the, the previous chat there, um, let, let's begin with um, uh, Putin's notorious essay back last July, in which he, which is supposedly a history essay, in, in which he denied that Ukraine was a proper nation or a legitimate state, or that it was a, a, a fabricated entity. Um, I, I would want to say, uh, well, well, yes, it is. Of course it is. But then so are all nations. Um, a, a nation is, some, is a form of consciousness, at least in the modern world, uh, leaving aside the, sort of the biblical tribal idea or North American Indian idea um, uh, of nation. But, um, but in the modern sense, it is an entity that exists in your head. Right? Um, and it may or may not be the same thing as the state that you live in. Um, the, the term Russia is relatively modern as well, and um, I, I could read out to you, but I think it would be tiresome to do so here, plenty of um, quotes from commentators as, as recently as the late 19th century who absolutely deny that Russian peasants, that, who the vast bulk of the population, had any sense of national loyalty or consciousness at all. Their loyalty mm. to their district, and foreigners began you know, 20 or 30 miles away, where dialects started to differ. 
Um, and uh, in the case of Ukraine, it's certainly true that the, the Ukraine, by the way, simply means borderland, um, that nobody really spoke about Ukrainians as a national entity until very well into the 19th century. And even then, as everywhere else, it was middle class intellectuals, townies, scholarly types, that the, the form of consciousness developed late. So um, in an ironic sense, we could concede that to uh, Putin's analysis, although I would say that um, what matters in this respect is how people feel now. If people feel themselves to belong together, uh, it, including one another and excluding others, then um, it is an outrage to violate that, particularly when they do have a state, which, however, imperfectly, and all states do this imperfectly, including Britain, um, uh, somehow enshrines that, th then it is an outrage to then go trampling all over it uh, militarily or any other way. Now, um, in the case of Ukraine and Russia, the situation is particularly difficult. Um, both of those countries and Belarus uh, speak languages which linguists unite in describing as Eastern Slavic. The Slavic languages fall into three main groups, the Southern Slavs, Yuk, South Yugoslavia, I think, mm -hmm. also including Bulgaria. Um, uh, the Western Slavs, so uh, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, and Sorbs, not Serbs, Sorbs, a small people group uh, still living in parts of Eastern Germany. And then Eastern Slavs, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Russians. Um, exactly where does a language, where, where does, what is a language and what is a dialect? This is a, a question I always used to ask jeeringly of my students um, and would then supply the answer. A language is a dialect with an army. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, you know, if we're making the distinction between Hungarian and Italian, that would be absurd. But within the same language groups, that is absolutely true. Right? Hmm. Um, uh, and the idea of standardization of languages is itself modern. It, it follows on in the long trajectory after the, not just the invention, but the wide availability of printed media and uh, centralization of government institutions. Um, well, it, when it comes to historical myth-making, the, the, comp the particular complication with Ukraine and Russia is that they both point to the same events as the origins of themselves. And for that, we have to look back to Kievan Rus. Now, Kievan Rus is a large state roughly in the area of much of what is now Ukraine and parts of the Western bits of Russia, centered on the capital, Kiev. In the, it, it was, it was uh, founded, insofar as we can discern this at all, by um, Viking, uh, Varangian traders trading down the, the river systems uh, to get to the place they really wanted to get to, which was Constantinople, which had in the uh, 8th, 9th, 10th century still a population of a million people, um, which was about 100 so times the size of Rome, which had shrunk to 10,000 and, and way bigger than anywhere else at this end of the Eurasian landmass. That was the place to trade with. So they established themselves in Kiev, founded a, a, a kingdom there, and then in the uh, late 10th century adopted um, the Byzantines' religion, which was Orthodox Christianity, um, to make themselves more acceptable, more respectable within European society. Um, so that is looked back upon as the founding myth uh, by modern Russia and by modern Ukraine. So they share the same founding myth, uh, and that is really rather awkward. Uh, that means that modern Russian nationalists will want to see Kiev and the area around it as intrinsically part of Russia, part of its historic origins, if you like. Um, now, now, what actually happened a couple of hundred years after that is that Kievan Rus was broken up by the Mongol invasions and nobody could resist the Mongols. Um, and the city was trashed, the population dispersed, 
and uh, what emerged after that was a number of petty Eastern Slavic principalities, all of which were vassal states of the Mongols and paying them taxes. And one of those states in the long run made itself more viable and successful than the others, mostly by being the collector of taxes for the Mongols. And that state was Muscovy. Eventually, the day came when it felt strong enough to challenge the by now weakened Mongols on the Volga. Um, and at first they lost, but in the end they were successful. And Muscovy then becomes the, the dominant state amongst the Eastern Slavs and grows and grows eventually pushes right the way across um, Asia to the Pacific, conquering the descendants of the people who had originally conquered them to become Russia. Um, okay, what about Ukraine? Well, um, West, what we now call Western Ukraine was for many centuries in the, the late Middle Ages and early modern times, part of the Polish and Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was a huge state dominating um, most of what's now Poland and Lithuania, of course, um, but also uh, large parts of uh, Belarus, most of Ukraine, right down to the Black Sea. And so Western Ukraine was part of that, and therefore this Orthodox population has Catholic rulers. Um, the uh, Ottomans and Tatars um, continued to dominate the Black Sea coast for a long time, but in the late 18th century, uh, under Catherine the Great, um, uh, Eastern Ukraine uh, came under Russian rule. Um, so you get a situation in which the, the east side of the country has been under Russian rule for quite a while. Um, the, west, uh, the western part of the country hasn't. In, in the late 18th century, Poland, Lithuania was broken up. There was no such state as Poland from the late 18th century until after World War I. And um, Western Ukraine um, was incorporated into the Austrian, later on we would say Austro-Hungarian Empire, again under Catholic rulers. Um, the, the 20th century, of course, had been absolutely tumultuous for the whole region. Um, so Central and Eastern Ukraine um, became part of the Soviet Union once the Tsar had been overthrown in 1917 and following ghastly civil war. Uh, and Western Ukraine um, was part of a reconstituted Poland at the um, after the First World War. But Poland was, was recreated by the victor powers. Um, right, fast forward to 1939. Uh, as everybody listening will know, uh, Poland was assailed by the Nazis in September 1939 in the West. And what you were taught in school, but everybody seems to have forgotten, is that the, the Soviets invaded the eastern side of the country, which included Western Ukraine. Um, and at the end of World War II, uh, the, Soviet, the, the, um, the, the British and the Americans allowed Stalin or agreed with Stalin that he would keep those territories that he had then taken. And that meant that the whole of Ukraine is Soviet Ukraine uh, during the Cold War. Now, um, uh, this in Western Ukraine, of course, this is a population that was not Russianized at all, saw itself as historically part of the West. It had been under Poland and Austria. So Soviet rule was immensely resented and ferociously resisted by guerrilla movements right down into the 1950s. Um, uh, Considering the, the, the Ukrainian experience of, of the Soviet Union as a whole, though, I mean, um, the, m many people listening will be aware of the, uh, the man-made famine created by Stalin in the early 1930s as a, desire, as a result of collectivizing the farms. Um, you know, that kind of economics, as, as we should know, just doesn't work. Um, and it resulted in mass starvation with, let's say, four million people dying it may have been many more than that, but 4 million is perhaps the safest number to stick with. So Western Ukrainians in Poland, not, not much liking being part of Poland, appearing across the border and seeing even worse things, far, far worse things happening in Central and Eastern Ukraine because the, the uh, what's called the Holodomor, the, the uh, famine 
you know, made famine afflicted Ukraine far worse than the other parts of the Soviet Union. So there's all that kind of um, resentment being there. Um, having said that, people in the eastern part of the country are more likely to identify as Russians. They become part of the Russian Empire in the late 18th century. Um, uh, certainly the government in, um, in St. Petersburg, uh, where, it, where it was during the last 200 years of Tsarist rule, uh, didn't think of Ukrainians as a separate entity. Um, people in Western Ukraine certainly did by the time you get to the 20th century. So that means that when Ukraine does finally become independent at the end of the Soviet Union, there's a number of people in the East who aren't really quite sure about this. They speak Russian as their main language. Is Ukrainian really a separate language anyway? Or is it just a bunch of Russian dialects? Um, uh, the government in Kiev is now insisting, well, it is, and maximizing difference between itself and standard Russian. We've seen the same thing happening in the Balkans with the maximizing the difference between Croatian and Serbian, for example. Um, and with some pressure on uh, Russian speakers to speak Ukrainian, which can stoke resentment, as one can imagine. So if, if you look at electoral maps of Ukraine, the results of its elections during its period of independence, until very recently, there was a sharp division between parties that won in the East and the parties that won in the West. You know, you think there's a, a sharp distinction in America between red states and blue states. Well, it was every bit as sharp, but it was a, a strict east-west divide in Ukraine. But since Putin's shenanigans of 2014, taking Crimea away, um, fostering separatist um, uh, revolts in uh, Donetsk and uh, Luhansk, um, this has had the effect of actually galvanizing people into a Ukrainian identity and making local Russian speakers in the East realize, no, we don't want to live under someone like Putin. Uh, Ukraine's a pretty chaotic democracy, but frankly, we prefer that. Mm. And, and from what we can make out, I mean, um, Zelensky, who is a strict centrist and not particularly nationalistic, uh, and a native Russian speaker himself, is getting 90% approval ratings right now when the war has stopped. I mean, there's, there's generally a tendency for people to rally around the flag when there is a war, but it's absolutely remarkable. But this has been going on actually since 2014, that, mm -hmm. that Putin has um, created his own enemies and pushed loads of people who might have sympathized with him and his rhetoric about Ukrainians being really Russians, uh, pushed them directly into the on. Right. So is, is he's kind of finding that with regards to his response to countries in NATO, isn't it? That, that the he was sort of counting on NATO being disunified, and it sort of has galvanised. Yes, and uh, disunited and generally feeble. And, and yeah. I have been as surprised as anybody else, and and delighted, but 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 really surprised. I mean, the, the, you've got a a centre-left German government voting to double its defence spending and send a load of military aid to Ukraine. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's a measure of the, the depth of the crisis that's now come upon us. Important. And yeah. I, I, I fear it may be too little, all, all of it may be too little too late. Yeah. I think well, that, go on. Yeah, I was just, just sort of the, the, the response to Crimea was pretty weak. Yeah. I, yes. And there were, there were no sanctions. That was just sort of yes. Russia got a bit more land and job done. It was, right. It was a bit I mean, this is slightly embarrassing because I think even if you had a, a non-fixed referendum, you might have had a vote to join Russia. But because the majority of the population there were ethnic Russians, um, Tatars who were very badly mistreated under Russian rule, and particularly under Soviet rule, where they were all deported by Stalin for supposedly having supported the Germans. Uh, they, they were deported in 1944 and not allowed back until decades later, um, and savagely mistreated. They def desperately wanted to remain part of Ukraine, as did ethnic mm -hmm. Ukrainians there. But I think there would probably have been a majority for doing it. Um, Crimea had been part of the Russian 
republic within the Soviet Union until 1954, when Khrushchev, in some mad whim, consigned it to Ukraine. Well, at the time, it, it didn't seem to matter. It'd be like moving a, a town from Kent into Sussex today, right? Uh, but once, once the whole thing's broken up, then it does matter. So I, I think that the, the West, partly because of Putin's sneaky tactics with these little green men and all the rest of it, and creating a fait accompli, partly because of the West's feebleness um, and Ukraine's unreadiness to engage in uh, a conflict, but, but also because th there was at least some legitimacy for that. Right. Uh, it didn't seem to be the place to stand and fight. Yeah. Well, I guess now. by by not doing anything, it's also enabled, um, you know, him to 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 push further. Well, well, yes, to assume that it'll be the same the next time around. Yes, yes, and I mean, this is <clears throat> you know, just taking the long view here. This is the historic weakness of democracies vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian regimes. That that the trouble with any democratic government is that they need to be elected next time around, and that's never more than about four years away. Um, mm. and, and therefore taking tough decisions that are going to cause pain is very, very difficult for any of them, and never mind their particular political complexion, to do, whereas authoritarians don't need to worry about public opinion. Mm. Um, well, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not speaking up for authoritarians here, but, but of course people are naturally feeble-minded and, and therefore are generally not ready to collectively... To, to take painful decisions um, that affect them now. Specific, yeah. I mean, we've seen the same thing with you know cl uh, climate change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you corral people into making uh, the kind of decisions that are necessary to... Um, uh, um, They're not going to benefit them. They're going to benefit people who don't exactly. might not exist yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, how, does, how does Putin... Um, how does... Uh, Putin's uh, and and the Orthodox Church. Like, how does that all mix in with this, with with the with the with the attack of Ukraine? Like, what? Well, in the in the in the earliest appearance of modern nationalism, all religious bodies, all of them, were opposed to nationalism. But Protestant and Protestant state churches and Orthodox churches were more easily reconciled to it because they are tied to particular states. And although the Orthodox Church had a torrid time under communism, I mean, it, it did attempt to be loyal to the state even then. With the end of communism, it's, it's far more back in its natural territory. Now, what about Putin? Does he really believe all this stuff? It's all, probably almost a meaningless question to ask. I mean, he's a KGB man. Um, he served a, a, a communist regime. He says now that he disapproves of it, but he, he only disapproves of it because really because it failed, right? Um, so he's, he's playing a card which I, I'm going to use the term nationalist a little bit lazily here. It, it's, a, it's a little bit more complicated to explain how Russians come at this. But, but let's just for sake of simplicity call it nationalist. And that, and working together with the Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church works very well. They're prepared to sanctify his geopolitical ambitions in the name of the Greater mm. Russia. Yeah, it's um, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? I mean, um, I, I I find it confusing myself. But I do wonder, like, what non-christians look at that situation you know because there's lots of pictures in the media where you see you know russian priests blessing you know russian soldiers and russian weapons yes, and, then yes. you'd, and then you'd see this juxtaposition then of of the same similar thing going on in, in ukraine and you think yeah. well they're both claiming to worship the same god the prince of you know jesus oh, yeah. the prince the prince of peace and yet these two it, it, it is mind-boggling. Well, well, yes, um, and this this brings us back to uh, the whole issue of what Christians are supposed to think about uh, issues concerning war and peace, which I've been interviewed about uh, at least once or twice lately. 
related to the stuff in my book, Gods of War. Uh, and as I explain in that book, that there can be no Christian justification for a war because Christianity is not a way of running wider society. If you think Christianity is a way of running wider society, then you should espouse some kind of historic state church, whether Catholic Orthodox or state church Protestant. And, and it's inconsistent then to be a pacifist. Um, Anabaptism fits most neatly with pacifism, like a withdrawal from society. I, I said to you at the outset that I, I'm an Anabaptist, but I'm, I'm not a pacifist because I can't, I can't quite see how, if it lies within my power to protect people who are being massacred, that I should simply keep my hands yes, in. Bond. But, but, but that doesn't mean that I can find some kind of Christian justification for war because there isn't one, because that's not what Christianity is. You know, when mm -hmm. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, if it were, my servants would be fighting. Right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So invocations of God uh, for war uh, on any side, I would say, really are blasphemous. Um, mm. Christianity is not a means of creating or uphold, upholding any particular state or political vision. That's not what Christianity is. Um, but nevertheless, uh, state churches are inevitably sucked into that. Um, and, and that happened very early on with, with um, during the course of the fourth century as uh, the church was kind of co-opted by the state and then in the West, at least, you get uh, Augustine coming along with his baptized uh, version of Cicero, the pagan, with the, the, the um, just war theory. Um, a, a classic example of what I mentioned, the outrageous idea I mentioned earlier on, that practice comes first and then doctrine comes along afterwards to, to sanctify it. Uh, mm. And I'm kind of hooligan who wants to say, well, yeah, okay, but that's not legitimate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's um, yeah, history is replete with examples of where um, the church gets into bed with the state, and um, it just leaves a sort of trail of a trail of destruction. Um, well, yeah, yeah, and it happens at a far lower level than simply warfare, because if you're going to get involved with politics and claim it's Christian politics at all, you're simply going to sully the name of God and and the gospel. And we can see, you don't have to look any further than America, where I'm still just about living for the next two weeks after having been here for um, 16, 18 years, whatever it is, um, 18 years, uh, to see that. Um, uh, you know, it, it's not that I have no political opinions or, or never express it. On the contrary, I have very strong political opinions, but they have their own rationale. They don't spring from the gospel because that's because the gospel isn't a way of running this world and to pretend that it is is going to make a travesty in the end of the gospel and to spread it in the eyes of anybody who might have given it um a hearing again as we can see today it's it's a very islamic view isn't it because islam very much views itself mm. as having you know this role as being politique as well you know yeah. as, a, as, as a system of of running the, a, a state in, in in a way whereas christianity at least originally um you know was never never saw itself you know it, it, it flourished within the state but never yeah. saw itself as uh, as 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 running it and right and... yes yes uh, I mean, there, there are some differences uh because uh islam doesn't have a unified organization or ecclesiastical body and it's at least arguable and we're seeing this now with constant splintering and ultra ultra radical groups in islam um you you can at least argue that there is no um legitimate uh state that doesn't encompass all the muslims of the world and that of course is one of the things around the modern state of france which is leading to serious political instability in muslim countries you know if i'm a radical islamist i could say that the the king of morocco is no rightful ruler right. for example right well yeah, and is it, but is it, it does get interesting when there are enough Christians to make a state, uh, and in the, in the sense of the gospel may not be itself political, but it does inform our political decisions. And then when you have 
enough Christians in a area, some obviously with political leanings or even a king or an emperor, as has been in the past, yeah. you then end up with trying to navigate that will, will always cause some sort of area where the, where the church will go in one direction or another. And it's easy to look back on history and go, well, that, that's where the church went wrong, is it went into power. But there are some times where you're like, well, how could it not? Because it was the majority of the... Well, it does seem unlivable in, 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 in a way. Like, because it, it strikes me as like pacifism as well. It's like, yeah, I like, I like the idea of pacifism, but, um, but it seems... There are cases where it would seem to me, at least, my intuitions would tell me that it's immoral to be a pacifist in certain situations. Right. In the right. same way that I guess when you're uh, a, a Christian in a particular, say you're in a particular area where there, you know, nearly you know ninety percent of the population are Christian, and so you know someone has to be a polit, you know, if you're in a modern, someone has to be a politician. So is it just semantics? You know, it's just like, well, I'm a Christian who is a politician, or am I a Christian politician? It seems right. Um, I mean, I th you know, if, if we look back at the early 4th century, historians estimate that the proportion of the population of the Roman Empire that were Christians in the early 4th century before Constantine, right, were between uh, either as few as 5% or as many as 15%, either way a smallish minority. Uh, you'd be hard pushed, with, and, and the precise religious beliefs of Constantine are endless, de endlessly debated. You'd be very hard pushed to say that he was... Uh, anything like an orthodox little old Christian, right? Mm. Um, and the political advantages that he gives the church, bring in a whole load of people who are coming in more for the social and political advantages thereafter. Uh, and by the time you get through to the 380s, then paganism is outlawed and people are essentially corralled into the church. And then along comes Augustine with his theory as to why that is good and you should force mm. them to come in. And yeah. not only that, but you should persecute um, uh, sectarians and breakaways and heretics. So, so no, uh, the glory of God. Well, you know, the majority of the people here are Christians. I'm not quite sure what that means in those sort of circumstances. Really. Yeah, not not in those circumstances. But I, I was sort of meaning in a more modern sense. Like I, I don't. That, I, I find the whole uh, you know the modern day sort of Christian political discourse quite um, uncomfortable because. Um, uh, I mean, are, are you saying there wouldn't be if if you were if you were a Christian? I mean, should you not get involved in politics, or if you do, oh, you I should would be, be perfectly happy. In in principle, I would be perfectly happy getting involved in politics. The politics is that uh, grubby compromises. Yes, which um, is why I don't like it. Yeah. Right, right, <laughs> and 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 that's it's it, it's bound to be so. It is bound to be so. Um, and so how do you square that with uh, claiming that what you're doing is being done on Christian ground? And in any case, mm. you can do any Christian expatiating upon their supposedly Christian political opinions for five minutes, and you'll find that they're simply baptizing with Bible verses or spiritual rhetoric, ideas that come from a completely different place. I mean, the very mm. building blocks of all modern political discourse, whether it's the uh, impersonal state, nationalism, capitalism, socialism, human rights, the rest of it, they're all creations of the modern world. They didn't exist back in the time of the Bible. And, and so I'm supposed to believe that you're... Um, you know, Christians should belong to your favourite political party. I just want to laugh, you know. Mm. Um, and it's not that I don't have opinions about any of those things. I do, but they have their own rationale. Mm. They tend to critique every political party um, if they come from the gospel. I think that's that's why Keller's got into trouble in this in the states, particularly as he, he tries to navigate critiquing all sides and generally both sides. All, all sides don't really like being critiqued. Well, um, I must admit, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised, but uh, I think Tim Keller has made a far better job than mm -hmm. almost all of the other evangelicals who've dabbled into the public realm than, that I know of. Yeah. Uh, although yeah. I don't agree with um, the specifics of his theology, I, I have absolutely enormous respect for the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess going back to Russia and Ukraine quickly, mm, yeah. do you think there is, in terms of the, the, the church in those countries, is there, 
what's the light is there any likelihood that um the orthodox church in russia will um will change its stance or or are they is this is, no. you know, I, is there I, anything that could happen in ukraine for them to to kind of rebel you know rebel in a way against against the state um I, is that I, is that likely i'm unimagined i mean i could be wrong but that is unimaginable to me yeah unimaginable the just to go back into something that I touched on obliquely and I said, oh, we won't go there, but maybe let's just do it in the last last few minutes. Um, uh, Rome, as we know, fell to the barbarians in the fifth century. And the uh, and so the Eastern Roman Empire, with its capital in Constantinople, continued for another thousand years and was the center of Eastern Orthodoxy. That was where Kiev and Rus, and so by derivation, Muscovy, and then Russia, took its Christianity from. After Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453, uh, in, in the following centuries, Russia started making large claims for Moscow as the Third Rome and defined itself as, as being precisely not the West, right? So there's quite a long history of Russia defining itself in, in that kind of negation, those negation terms. Now that was pushed back on quite a bit by Peter the Great in the early 18th century, who wanted to say, oh no, I mean, he was a sort of, um, he had little time for the church in many ways. Um, uh, and he wanted to westernize Russia. He moved its capital to St. Petersburg, uh, facing the West. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the central dynamic running through Russian history ever since has been this dilemma. Is Russia the anti-West or is it struggling to be part of the West? Hmm. Um, the, the, the reason that most people in Russia resented communism was not because they wanted to be capitalists and democrats, but because they saw Marxism as a godless, alien, rationalistic, Western creed. Westerners completely misunderstood that, which is why they were so shocked when Solzhenitsyn got kicked out, came to the West, and they thought he was going to praise, you know, America and Britain and France and all the rest of it, and he had nothing but castigation for us um, on those grounds. Now, what Putin did during the first 10 years in power was kind of ride the cusp of that central contention in Russian popular political thought. Are we a part of the West and modernizing, or are we the anti-West? But from around 2007, 2008, he's clearly come down on the side of we are the anti-West. That's that's mm. who we are. Uh, and that whole way of thinking, which can draw on, you know, Orthodox authority, Eastern Orthodox authority, Russian Orthodox authority, that is in the ascendant today. And it's possible to see that going away any time soon. So there's just there's just no real precedent, you know, in that in that tradition for for them to do. It. And it, the thing that's so frustrating because, like, for me, I look at that situation. And I think what ha the best thing I can think of that situation is the church in Russia to do something like that. I just feel would be, you know, what a testimony that would be. How powerful that well, would be. There are the people actually... who will do that, but but the institution as a whole, no. I okay. just. Yeah. That's not the place to look. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, I, I suspect that if there were a change, it would come as a result of, um, sadly, radical secularization in America, in America, in Russia, which, right. which capitalism is, as we have seen in the West, is much more able to do thoroughly than communism. Communism simply acted as a sort of deep freeze uh, on a population that thought differently. And when communism finally came to an end, people relapsed back to it, even after 70 years. Right? Whereas capitalism is radically secularizing. And maybe that might happen, but, but I, I don't see it happening in the next few generations, at least. So, um, yeah, I guess, yeah. Where, where do you kind of see things going, you know, in terms of... Um... I, I don't know. Everything depends on the military outcome. And that, in turn, depends on whether the West has the stomach to give Ukraine the weapons it actually needs. We talk about it today, but it, and this is, I'm speaking entirely as a non-specialist here, it looks to me like it's too little too late. 
You know, they were yeah. given really serious weapons just needed to happen a week ago. And now they're being sent, what, a couple of dozen howitzers. Now the offensive has already started. Whether they'll even get to the front by the time it collapses is, is an open question in my mind. Um, and, and where are the, um, the high altitude air defense systems? No sign of them. So, so uh, you know, everything depends on the military outcome. And a lot of the military outcome depends on um, what the West will or won't do. Yeah. Well, I, I guess as we come to the sort of hour, hour mark, I, I think there's a bit of a mix of um, responses from from at least the UK church on, on how to to respond. There's been various resources sent out. I'd be interested in your opinion on on, on this, just as, as Christians that um, I, fi I find partly from my own experience, my understanding of Orthodox Church, all this i'm very very new to the conversation in understanding differences and recognizing them as as, as christians i suppose uh, the and and I'm kind of wondering if you have christians that are so intertwined with the state what's what would, I, what would a good response be are they are they fellow christians are they their um it is yeah it, i guess you know, it's, it's a but that's a very hard call because it's like asking me to make a choice between judgmentalism and feeble-mindedness mm. <laughs> yeah and it's, 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 it wasn't a question i expected a solid answer to because we're not god but it's I, I mean i would i would say uh and you could draw on um completely different situations and we can all think of them for this that if if you listen to somebody talk and it becomes quite evident that their real faith is their politics, and it doesn't matter what the politics are, mm. they're probably not a Christian. Yeah. Right. If, if, it, if it's really about politics or something social, um, then they're probably not meaningfully a, a Christian because, because Christianity is about calling people out of the world to follow Christ and give up themselves and their ambitions and all the rest of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, from my, my understanding, of course, I'm observing what's going on in Britain from a, uh, across 3,000 miles of cold water. Um, uh, it seems mm. pretty good and pretty encouraging. And I, I think it's great, you know, um, that we are, we are called upon to, um, welcome people who are destitute and in need, uh, and, and refugees. That doesn't necessarily... Mm follow over into politics by the way because no state is uh, um, a haven for all comers you can't have a state that way um, but that doesn't again this is where being a Christian just clashes with uh, the necessities of politics but where where Christians can welcome refugees that's that's a great and important thing to do and I am thoroughly heartened by what I see people doing mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think on that point, just to, to make it some something that I've been following a little bit, a guy named Chris Kandaya. If you haven't come across him, he's been quite active with um, adopting and fostering, but he's also been very good on the forefront of um, hosting Afghan re re refugees. And now there's a whole thing set up for Ukrainian refugees and how the church can be active in that. Um, so it's called the Sanctuary Foundation. If you look up look up that on Google, Sanctuary Foundation and Ukraine, you'll find ways of giving money and also being active in possibly even opening up your home if you have the ability to do so. Um, so I just thought I'd plug that as that that's pertinent to the conversation as well. Mike, if there are any resources, uh, you know, in terms of people want to find out a little bit more about the the history of uh, of the Rus and, and Kiev um and and their kind of origin stories um do you have would you have any resources that you would you would recommend uh for people to find yeah, out a little bit more pro probably the best thing would be to uh post um maybe we could post web links to them uh sure. after this so that people can look them up and decide which ones they like yeah that'd be great great no, that that would be really helpful yeah um so I know I'd like to dig a little bit deeper, especially when it's connected to Vikings as well. I like the, uh, the, the uh, Tom Tom Holland. Uh, he's he's got a podcast. Um, 
and um, he he's, he did a, a bit of a series on this. So when you were talking about how they travelled down the, the rivers from um, you know from Scandinavia to heading towards um, you know um, Constantinople and things like that, so it was um, and settling uh, you know in what in modern, modern day Ukraine. Yeah, no, so well, the one, rest is history. It's, it's, right. It's yeah, the one particularly good historian I would recommend give, giving like a one volume history of Ukraine is Sergei po uh, Plochy. Uh, his book's called The Gates of Europe. Uh, but okay. again, we, we can give the link for that later sure. on. Sure, that'll be helpful. Great. Well, um, yeah, thank you very much, Mike, for taking the time. It's oh, been okay. really, uh, really, really fascinating. And I'm sure a lot of people listening will find that helpful too. And it's something really useful for us to have to share with people who want to know a little bit more about the, the history. Because like you said, you know, there's a, uh, you know, Putin's letter. I mean, I'm assuming that was pretty well widely read and accepted in russia would that be would that be yeah there yeah, there wasn't too much debate about yeah yeah you can't you can't debate i found my, my my russian friends whom i can't contact at all now um are have gone quietly silent on a whole load of things because you just can't afford to get into trouble you know so and that's the case yeah. for a long time. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Well, thanks, Mike. It's been been a, yeah really really interesting, and um, you've got at least one thank you in the chat there. Uh, we we did have a couple of viewers after all. You didn't lose them all with your controversial comments. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. We tried at the start. Um, cool. Well, yeah. Thank you very all much, right. and um, I'll, I'll I'll close out with just a, a couple of things for people who are, who are watching. Um, just to say, if you are interested in uh, supporting the channel, we do have a Patreon page and that just goes to paying for StreamYard and, and things like that. We don't have, uh, we're not supported financially ourselves in that um, as we have full time jobs to do that. Um, but if you do want to support us or, or get involved in Patreon, we are doing a Patreon only chat next Thursday just to update those who do support the channel. And you can ask us anything in that space. It's not going to be uh, put live. So if you want to be involved in that, do uh, go to patreon.com forward slash critical witness and um, you can sign up from, I think it's a pound or something like that for, for a month. Um, grand. And, and so look out for more uh, chats from us. Subscribe to YouTube, our social media, all that stuff. You can find it um, and we'll update you on our next chats as they come. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of your evening. We'll see you later.